Hello, River family. Uh, so glad you're joining us again on this broadcast airing on December the 6th. Really, really glad uh, that you're here with us. And want to let you know, online community, we consider you a part of our church. Even if uh, you're in a different town or a different county, we still consider you a part of our church. Love for you to be a part in the ways that you can be a part of. So welcome. Glad that you're here. A lot of things we want to tell you about. Uh, first of all, this Sunday... December the 6th, if you're watching this, um, we are reopening. We closed for a couple of weeks. We are reopening, and we're reopening uh, at 10 o'clock, and we're just doing worship on Sunday morning. We're having our nurseries. Uh, this week is Family Sunday, but you, you're, you're at home, so don't worry about it right now. But I wanted to let you know about one thing. We are creating a mask-only section. It'll be over here to my right. And so if you're somebody who's wanting to come and you've been afraid to come, you can enter and exit by an exterior door and be in the mask-only section if that feels more comfortable to you. So just to let you know, that is up and running right now. Also, every Tuesday, 6 a.m. is our men history, and they'll be on uh, Genesis. I encourage you to read Genesis 30 and 31. Uh, this week, 6 a.m. every Tuesday morning. This Sunday, Sunday the 6th, if you're watching this in real time, um, we have our, our Women with Purpose, and they'll be meeting in the back at 4 p.m. in the back building, and they're going to get mugged. Okay, let me tell you what I mean by that. They're going to be having a mug exchange, so I encourage you to come be a part of that. Uh, bring a mug, any kind of mug, as far as I know, should be getting more information via website or from uh, the leaders of that group. So hope you can come be a part of that. They'll be spreading out, socially distancing. They're going to be careful. Uh, also, this coming Sunday... Um, I mean, this coming Wednesday, I apologize, uh, we will begin our youth ministry. They'll be meeting a couple of more weeks before uh, they uh, break for the Christmas holiday. So that will be beginning soon. You'll hear more and more from that, uh, from, from Matt on that. Also, uh, each of the weeks um, and Sundays that we celebrate uh, for um, celebrate in worship, in the sanctuary, we will be having a food drive, and that is for On the Way Home Ministries. It is a food bank that's to the south of us. Uh, they don't necessarily get as many donations because they're out of the city, but it helps service people uh, south of town and in the south part of town. So uh, you can bring food items. We're going to put them under the tree in the sanctuary. It's going to be very cool. Hope you are a part of that. also want to let you know about the fact that Sunday the 13th, December 13th, will be hot chocolate and crafts for the kids. So come a little early, stay a little late. Hot chocolate, crafts for the kids. I think you'll want to be here a little early for that. It'll be a lot of fun. I will also be doing uh, baptisms in this month. And so if you are, have made a recent decision for Christ, or if you made a decision for Christ years ago but haven't been baptized, I want to encourage you to contact me. You can contact me at pastordavid at theriveravilene.com. Pastor David at the riverabilene.com. Let me know you're interested in that. I'd love to have conversation with you. Also, you can be a part of this community, even though maybe you're not able to be here in person, by giving. And there are three different ways you can give. You can give by sending a check to 539 U.S. Highway 83, uh, Abilene, Texas 79602. Um, you can send a check that way, or you can give by secure text at 84321. 84321, that's secure text, or you can give via the website, which is theriverabilene.com. So I encourage you to be a part of that. There's a, there's a pull down, and then you can give via securely on the website. So I want to encourage you to be a part of that. And now uh, we've been talking about making the prophecies of Christ personal. And so here's my uh, trivia, somewhat connected question. What is... What is the tradition of the hanging of the Christmas pickle? What is the tradition of the hanging of the Christmas pickle? It's part of the top ten traditions. See if you know that. Talk amongst yourselves. See you in a sec. Who breaks the power of sin and dark? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger The King of glory, the King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth, who 
who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings come on this is amazing grace this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life that i would be set free oh jesus i sing for all that you've done for me who brings our chaos who brings our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory and who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of his brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings yeah this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my Sing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And worthy is the King who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquers the grave. Oh, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Yeah. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. Oh, that you would bear my cross. Oh, you lay down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Come on, has he done a lot for you? Amen. Well, I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to a slave wretch like me. And I heard about his glory, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Come on. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. And he loved me ere I knew him. And all my love is due him. He plunged me into victory beneath the cleansing flood. Heard about his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming
Has anyone seen my dad? Hey, 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 Logan River family, Pastor David here. So glad you joined us uh, for this. Another message in the Advent season, the season of appearance, whenever we remember um, that Jesus appeared. And as I told you in my first sermon in this series, I felt like the Lord uh, impressed on my heart that we were called to make the prophecies personal. And they were ways of preparing us for encountering Christ during um, Christmas which is kind of interesting that it's Christmas, the advent of the Messiah, the Savior, and yet, um, in a very strange way, we can forget Him during this season. I think it's also kind of urgent. Let me describe something to you. Uh, you see, with, with churches closed and online, with uh, faith community sort of fractured in this time, uh, the barometers of our life to keep ourselves on track that it's about Jesus, it's about Jesus, it's about Jesus, um, are kind of broken. And it reminded me of the story of uh, Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell um, was born in a Christian home and was raised to love God and to be a part of all the things that remembered God, Christmas, Easter, those kinds of things. And over the course of his raising, over time, he became a, a very, very devout, if you will, atheist pushing God completely out of his life, becoming very, very hardened. His daughter at one point uh, said this. I, I think it's an, it's an amazing quote. She said, somewhere at the bottom of his heart, in the depths of his soul, there was an empty space that once had been filled by God, and he never found anything else to put there. You see, I, I think over time, we can lose the meaning of things, especially the, the, the intrinsic spiritual kingdom of God meaning of things. A cross can become a piece of jewelry instead of a reminder of what it's all about. So I encourage you, in this time, we are called to make the prophecies that prepared the way for the coming, the advent of the Messiah. We're called to make them personal so that they open the door for Jesus to show up in a very real way in your life during this season. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for the, the beauty and the wonder of who you are. And I pray that you would forgive us when over time, sometimes we just ebb away from you. We ebb away from making you priority. We ebb away from celebrating your birth. And that we find ourselves in this, this kind of chasm of 
commercialism and secularism and in a place where we can absolutely push you out of our hearts when in fact, Lord, we know that we are not called to do that. So Lord, I pray now that you'd begin to open us to this amazing prophecy and help us to answer these questions, Lord. Help us to answer the questions of are we willing to clear the clutter? And are we really willing to learn to turn? So come Holy Spirit. And I pray that I would decrease, you would increase, be our preacher and teacher. And all the people said, Amen. All right. Let's talk about this amazing, amazing prophecy. The first a story about a wealthy European couple just had a, a child and they decided that they wanted to have the, the baby baptized. And so they invited friends and clergy to their house to be able to baptize the baby. They wanted to do it in their, I said house, it's really a mansion. It was gargantuan. And the guests began to arrive in their fancy cars and in their fancy clothes and all the all the coats were placed in an upstairs bedroom. Many of the coats were expensive and elegant and furs and that sort of thing. And They were just treated like absolute royalty. And at one point it was decided that after they'd had all their, their fun and their food that it was time for the, um, the, the, the big event. It was time to baptize the baby. And so everyone said, well, where's the baby? And there was this mass confusion because it seemed as though nobody really knew where the baby was. The object of the reason why they had gathered. Sounds a lot like Christmas in the United States. So let's look at this prophecy and see if we can avoid the ebbing away from what is really meaningful. Starting in Mark, the Gospel of Mark, it's Matthew, Mark's second book in the New Testament. Mark's a very simplistic gospel, very straightforward. He, he, doesn't, um, he doesn't do flowery language and he doesn't over-explain. He goes right to the point. And so let's look at Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The beginning, that's a word, arche, uh, which actually means like in the beginning. So he's mimicking Genesis chapter 1 from the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament. So he's mimicking this because he's saying, here's, a, here's another beginning of everything. The beginning of the good news, Greek word ewangelion, but we use our, our uh, old English word godspell or gospel, which means a good news. Ewangelion is a good news. So it's the very beginning, and here's a good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Interesting. Jesus means uh, Yahweh say, or it means uh, Je Jehovah saves or Jehovah's salvation, and then it's Messiah, which is the Greek word Christ, Messiah, the Anointed One, coming from God, and then the Son of God, which is a prophetic name for the Anointed One, coming from God. So it's like Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. This is the dude. He gives no pedagogy. He doesn't even talk at all about his birth or anything like that because Jesus came as a servant. And in Roman understanding, which is what this was written to, people it was mostly written to, uh, there's no pedagogy. There's no, there's no lineage for a slave. They're not considered that important in that way. So he's, he's kind of focusing on the fact that Jesus came to save and to serve. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. This comes from Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, verse 3, it's a little bit of Malachi uh, as well, and it's a little bit of Exodus as well, but mostly Isaiah. And I'm going to read this, and we're going to get to question 1. I will send my messenger ahead of you, it's going to be John the Baptist, who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Let me read that again. I'll send you my messenger ahead of you who prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. It's a prophecy of, of John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Did you know that John the Baptist and Winnie the Pooh have something in common? 
They have the same middle name. It's a dumb joke. Stick with me, all right? John the Baptist is going to show up, and he is going to prepare the way. And it's a picture of what would happen in this time when a monarch wanted to take a trip. There would be an officer assigned to go ahead of the chariot. And they were to, to flatten the ruts, to clear the way, to make sure that the monarch from one location to another location had the smoothest ride possible. That was that officer's job. It was, it was like in, in Old English, a, a pavor. A pavor was supposed to come in and make everything flat and to make it clean so that people could travel without um, lots of issues in their travel, without bumps in the road and pit, uh, pits and potholes and those kinds of things. So it's one of those situations where he's saying this prophecy, if we make this personal, is we're going to clear the way. We're going to open the path for the Lord's appearance, for the Lord to show up in our lives. We are going to clear the way, make the path straight. We're going to pave the way for Jesus to show up. So here's, here's a good thermometer as to whether or not we've ever done this. If we've made this prophecy personal. At the end of most of your Christmases, do you feel like it's been about the appearance of Christ or something else? At the beginning, ramping up to December 25th, Fifth and the celebration of, of the birth of Christ, has it been more about the fluff and the other stuff than it, has been, than it has been about the birth of Jesus, the one who would come to save us? Prepare the way. Let's talk about Christmas traditions, and let's talk about effort. All right, here are the top ten Christmas traditions. Number one is to pick out a Christmas tree. A lot of us have done that if you're a live tree kind of person. The second one is to watch a tree lighting ceremony, like the carol lights, whoop, whoop, in Texas Tech University. Decorate your house and yard with Christmas lights, kind of a regular holiday tradition. A secret Santa where you're kind of secretly giving gifts to somebody. Uh, building a gingerbread house. We've never really done that in my house, maybe once. Countdown. Number six, countdown to Christmas with an Advent calendar. It's a way of kind of focusing on the birth of Christ. Mailing holiday cards. Uh, watching Home Alone, the movie. It's like it become a holiday tradition. I think tradition. I think Elf is in that category category as well. Hanging of the Christmas pickle. Now this, what the heck is that? So the hanging of the Christmas pickle was a tradition that began sort of by. Uh, a, a company called Woolworth, Woolworth, Woolrich. It, it's in the 1800s. They were trying to sell these ornaments. They weren't selling very well. They attached a a sort of a tradition to it that if you hung this, all the ornaments were like vegetables and 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 they were uh, fruits. And this one was a cucumber, and it looked like a pickle. And and what you do is you hung it. You hung it on the night uh, before on Christmas Eve, and the first kid to come out. To find the pickle, got an extra gift. Apparently, some people still do this. I've never done it. Anyway, hanging of the Christmas pickle. Uh, Yule logs, which I still don't really know what those are. Anyway, Yule logs. Think about the efforts that we put in all these traditions. And out of ten traditions, only one has anything to do with Christ. If we're going to go by percentages, 90% of the effort to prepare the way for the Lord is not to prepare the way for the Lord. Only 10% is. You see, the ebbing away and the hardening of our hearts and the movement toward this secular, secularization and, and kind of emptying our hearts happens when we're not preparing the way. We're unwilling to prepare the way. Think of this. If you stripped away all your efforts, all your times, all the things you do to make Christmas happen in your house, would there be anything left that is of substance to the appearance of the Messiah? It reminds me of this story about a little 15-year-old boy named Joey. Joey was uh, born with special needs. 
his um, mom was um, kind of a strong alcoholic. She actually died giving birth to him. Joey was slower, um, sort of on a lower childlike level, even though he was 15. And Every year at church, they had this um, Christmas Day service. And on the Christmas Day service, they had a Christmas tree, and they had gifts for all the children that were present. And he loved Christmas time for church, and his dad kept taking him to church, which is an amazing thing. But there was um, somebody who was um, kind of mean in this time at the church. I don't know if it was a kid or somebody who thought something might be funny, but what happened is he walked in on Christmas Day, and they got there a little early, and he went over to the Christmas tree, and and he looked, and it was a huge present for him, huge. And, and all the way through the service, all he could think about was, is it a bicycle? Is it a sled? He was just so excited about it. And at the end of the service, the pastor finished, and, and they, they called the kids to come forward, and they would come get their, their gifts. And he got his gift, and he sat on the front pew, and he began to open it up. And then he, then he looked inside, and all, he just stopped. And all of a sudden, his, his eyes began to tear up, and, and he began to sob. There was nothing in the box. There was nothing. Somebody played a cruel joke on him. Well, I believe, beloved, that we've done the same thing with Christmas sometimes, is, is if we pushed everything else out, if all that other stuff got stripped away, it might feel like an empty gift because we're not preparing the way for Jesus. Are you preparing the way for Jesus at the center of your family? If, if we were to ask your kids what Christmas is about at the end of Christmas, would they completely get it wrong? In your time growing up, 18 years of growing up, would you say of those 18 Christmases, was it about Jesus? Did did your parents prepare the way? You see, if you strip it all away, is there a profound emptiness? Or is all that fluff just fluff, but at the center is the coming of Jesus Christ? Prepare the way. Don't put any challenges up for Jesus. Open the door. Make it a red carpet for Jesus to be celebrated in your home and in your own heart. How many Christmases, how many Christmases have gone by without Christ? Where other stuff was more important. How many? Think about that for just a minute. John the Baptist was born to live in a interesting part of the world to prepare the way for Jesus. His big day came when he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes the sin away of the sin of the world. There he is right there. That's the Messiah. That was his big day. Everything else is irrelevant. Strip it away, beloved. Are you willing to clear the clutter so that Christ can be at the center? Are you willing to clear the clutter to make Christ the center? Now, it goes on in the passage and it kind of shows a little bit about what John the Baptist did to fulfill this prophecy. And here it goes like this. He said this, and so, and so. So here's the prophecy. Now he's going to say what John did to fulfill the prophecy. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness. Wilderness is a, is a word for, uh, it's eremos, which means um, essentially desert, but it's, it's less about desert and more about nobody lives there. Okay, It is a desolate, desolate place. It's about 20 miles from Jerusalem. And that 20 miles from Jerusalem, uh, in the Old Testament, there's a word for it that actually um, uh, meant like a, the, the forgotten place or... or uh, uh, that just an arid, horrible place. It's rugged. It's not a pretty place. So he's in the wilderness. That's how the the term is is translated. Preaching a baptism of repentance. Everybody say the word for repentance. Repentance. Preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. We think potentially 300,000 people made their way out to be baptized by John. It's an interesting thing. And they were confessing their sins and they were baptized in the Jordan River. Interesting way that they did baptisms. Baptisms at this particular time are done in a way um, we sort of think a different way. Let me tell you about that. The baptism is is done where uh, the person would kind of kneel down into the river and then they would go face first. And actually, uh, John probably didn't even lay hands on anybody. He probably is administering the baptism as the go-between between them and God. They're confessing their sin. They're confessing the fact that, that God is not the center part of their lives. And then they're being baptized as a way of, of saying, I'm turning my life around, because we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothes that were made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and honey. <laughs> That sound good to you? There's an abundance of bees in this area, so there's plenty of honey. Locusts, they, they did them a couple of different ways. They would boil them in salt water and then eat them. Or they would dry them in an oven and they would grind them into a powder and that powder would be mixed with um, honey. Sound good? Anyway, it's a diet and his clothes, all these things are saying that this prophecy coming from Isaiah, he's the new Elijah. He has the spirit of Elijah. He's preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. So he wore these, uh, 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 made, uh, these clothes made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his weight and ate locusts and honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one who's more pow powerful than I, the straps of whose sandal I am not worthy to stoop down and to untie. I baptize you with water, which is a repentance, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Water, repentance. So the way he carries out this prophecy, he goes out into the wilderness, into uh, some place between uh, Judea and the Dead Sea. He goes on the opposite side of the Jordan River, symbolically saying we hadn't come into the promised land yet. And he's preaching this gospel that you need to turn your heart around. You need to change your mind and focus on God confess your sins and focus on God, and that is going to lay the groundwork, that is going to open the door for the Messiah to show up. Now, it's so interesting that rarely do we think about repentance and Christmas. We don't think. Now, when we get to Easter, we think about this. Now, I, I found that we were decorating our tree the other day, and we had multiple crosses that we put on the tree, and I thought that was kind of interesting. I'm like, it's kind of Easter. But Jesus was born to die for me. There's got to be a repentance that happens. Repentance is a, a, an interesting word. It's metanoio, and it's this word that means to have a change of, of mind and direction, change of heart. It's a, it's a supernatural changing. You're going this direction and it's a false direction and there's a change. This is wrong. This is a wrong focus and you change and you go a different direction. What's happening is people are coming to John and they're realizing all they focused on was themselves, fluff, stuff that was unimportant and they haven't focused their life on God. So you see, they needed to learn to turn. They need to learn to turn. You see, it reminds me of this uh, teacher in, in England. She had uh, had a group of, of elementary kids, and she decided one of the class projects during the Christmas time would be to let them kind of build and put together uh, this nativity set. And uh, they're putting it all together, and it, there was talk about anything but Jesus. It's just They're just doing stuff. And they're putting it all together. It's a little class project. One little boy keeps looking at it, and he's you can tell he's just getting more and more perturbed. And as they kind of figured out and put it all together, she sees him, she sees that he's just not happy with stuff, and she finally says, Well, what you know, what's going on? And he said, I'm just wondering, I want to know where does God fit into all of this? Great question. Where does God fit into all this? A change, a repentance, is 
my focus has been on something other than God. My focus has been on stuff, on success, on myself, on my worries, on my grief. On This has been bigger than God. I need to repent. I've got to turn directions and say I was wrong. That's confession. And now I want to fo focus and give all of my attention toward Jesus, toward God Almighty. It's amazing to me that we can not let God be God on God's birthday. We can't let Jesus be God on Jesus' birthday. We've got all these other things going on, and we're just missing the fact that we're supposed to clear the clutter, and we've got to repent. Do you want this Christmas to be the best Christmas you've ever encountered with God Almighty? Then you need to repent of all the things that you've allowed to be bigger than God. What gets your attention? What gets your time? What gets your dollars? What gets your focus? What consumes your very mind and soul that is not God? So let me be like an old country preacher. You need to repent. You need to turn from those and turn towards God. This prophecy gives us two amazing things. It says to prepare the way. Prepare the way. That means we got to clear the clutter. You know what? If you got traditions going on that are keeping Jesus out of your family, get rid of them. If you're investing time and energy and stuff that just is not going to get you there with the Lord, not going to help your family come to know the Lord, not going to invite Jesus into your family, man, just don't. They're not important. They're not important. Let them go. Or redeem. Make them about Jesus. Clear the clutter. Prepare the way. Open the door to Jesus. And secondly, look at your own heart. What owns you right now? What owns you right now? Repent. Just like those people coming down to the Jordan River, confessing their sins that their life had not been about God Almighty, and they're turning and refocusing their attention. God Almighty. Clear the clutter. Learn to turn. And all of a sudden, Christ comes back to Christmas. Christ comes back to Christmas. Beloved, don't let another Christmas go by you when at the end of it, He hasn't been honored, welcomed, hasn't appeared because he wasn't invited. He didn't clear the clutter. He didn't repent. Well, in that big, fancy mansion, as they were looking around, wondering where the child was that they're supposed to baptize, everybody's in a panic. They're running all around the mansion. When at one point, somebody goes into the room where they had laid all these elegant coats. And they unearth the coats to discover the baby. They had completely forgotten the most important person that evening. And they almost smothered him. Don't lose Jesus. Don't lose Jesus in Christmas. Why is it important? Because the stream of our, of our culture is pushing you away into a land of fluff and frivolity and forgetting the Savior. Clear the clutter. Learn to turn. Watch Him show up. Lord, I pray that Your Spirit would uh, come into every family that's watching right now, into everyone who hears this message. And Lord, that they would just look at their effort at their time, at what they're spending their money on, and if it was all stripped away, would it be about Jesus? Lord, I pray that they would evaluate that with your Holy Spirit. 
Secondly, Lord, man, we are so focused on lots of stuff that ain't you. Look in our hearts, Lord. We choose right now to repent and to confess the things that we've allowed to stand between us and you. Help us, Lord Jesus, to turn, to repent. Lord, I pray that this would be the kind of a Christmas at the end of it, it would be an amazing encounter of a move of God in our families and in our church because we cleared the clutter and we learned to turn. In Jesus' name, amen. There are times, uh, beloved, in, um, in our our family's life. So every every seven years, Christmas occurs on a Sunday, and there are times when the kids were smaller. Uh, you know, Daddy's a pastor, so we would go and we would go have a Christmas service, and we would do nothing at the house until after the Christmas service. So we'd go celebrate Jesus, and then we'd come back and we'd open the gifts and do that. Those, I think, were some of the most powerful Christmases we ever encountered because it started with what was. And it made everything else be coated with the Messiah. So, if we're going to make this prophecy um, personal, we're going to clear the clutter. We're going to learn to turn. God bless you.